when I thought earlier on the year about what I would be saying to you today, I was going to be talking all about the fact that absolutely it's a new decade. There are lots of opportunities out there. There are lots of challenges. And I think that the challenges that the profession is facing based on the, the, the changing context, the focus on sustainability, the importance of um, ensuring that uh, we're getting real transparency into our supply chains, that we're embracing digitization. We're embracing the new technologies which allow us to be able to manage supply chains more effectively, more efficiently, with better information which allows us to take de better decisions. And then, of course, along came COVID-19 and the whole world has literally turned upside down. So that new context now is very different. Um, it's very real. Uh, it's very much uh, affecting all of us in, in our, our daily lives, and it's affecting all of the organizations that we work for, and to very, very differing degrees. And I have talked to many people over the last few weeks and it is clear that once everybody had got round the challenges of working remotely, working from home, um, then depending on which sector you're working in, the, the impact of coronavirus, of COVID-19 on your organization and your business and your sector has been really very different. Um, some sectors have literally seen their demand disappear. If you work in hospitality, in catering, hotels, restaurants, pubs, cafes. Clearly, from the moment that the government locked down the country, uh, you, there has been no demand, and I mean almost no demand for your businesses. Uh, if you're working in food retail, however, it's changed uh, the other way because more people are now working from home, more people are therefore eating at home, and therefore more people are buying more from supermarkets. And if you work in between that in terms of food supply, well, yeah, it's changed, not, not to zero, but it's changed dramatically because, of course, you're, you've, had a, you've had a real big uh, shift in, in, in mix. So the context has changed for all of us. And what I wanted to do today was just talk a little bit about how we as the professional body see that impacting upon the profession. It's very clear that with the impact of COVID-19, we need to make sure that our supply chains are not just focused on achieving best value, but are truly resilient. And COVID-19, the pandemic, is not the only factor out here. If we think about what we're already seeing in terms of trade barriers, in terms of tariff barriers, uh, the uh, continued imposition of tariffs between uh, China and the USA, um, if we think of Brexit and the impact that, that will have on the UK, and what barriers there may or may not be as and when we, we, we leave the EU at the, you leave the EU at the end of the transition period at the end of 2020. These are all going to impact significantly on supply chains. And ensuring that our supply chains are truly agile and are resilient and able to cope with these different barriers, able to cope with the different geopolitical uh, issues that we're seeing is a fundamental challenge for, for professionals in procurement and supply. Um, and then we have the challenge of technology. And not to me so much a challenge, but really an opportunity, because technology is absolutely going to power supply chains. It's technology that's gonna help procurement and supply professionals to be able to operate in a more effective and more efficient way. Um, and then it would be remiss of me not also to start mention some of the sustainability and environmental challenges and i just highlighted here single-use plastics and indeed the backdrop of this slide just shows the sheer challenge and the scale of the challenge that the world is facing in terms of misuse of single-use plastics and again let's be really careful because single-use plastics uh, like the ones we see on this slide are absolutely the ones that we want to eradicate that we don't want to see damaging the environment, damaging the world in which we operate. At the same time, single-use plastics, when those single-use plastics are used to help save people's lives, either through producing drug delivery systems or indeed through producing PPE, uh, which is fundamentally important and critical to all of us these days, those are not bad single-use plastics. Kind of, I guess it's a kind of a, a little bit like cholesterol. It's bad cholesterol and good cholesterol. 
And whereas you want to have good cholesterol, if the bad cholesterol you want to eradicate, and that's the same issue with single-use plastics, we want to make sure that the world is focusing in the right responsible way on reducing single-use plastics. So supply chains have been turned upside down by coronavirus and the impact that it's had. And those organizations that found themselves reliant upon single or large suppliers, those organizations that had focused on manufacturing with supply chains, which were lean, but potentially very long, or indeed the focus on how did we make sure there was no working capital, no stock in our supply chains, a real focus on it must be lowest cost. And all of that I think has been exposed in terms of then a lack of resilience to be able to cope with some of the changes in demand that our supply chains have all been facing. Could we ever have forecast the scale of some of these demand changes? No, we could not. However, having supply chains which are resilient and supply chains which are able to deal with peaks and troughs in demand is absolutely something that good supply chain and procurement professionals should be putting in place. And that also requires very often us to make sure we're developing the right suppliers. And the right suppliers, maybe these are nearshore suppliers, maybe these are suppliers that, uh, that maybe these are suppliers that can bring a particular solution to our supply chains. And, and maybe this sometimes requires companies to invest in suppliers. And I've been really encouraged over the last few weeks and months to see some organizations taking steps to make sure that they protect their supply chains, they invest in their suppliers, and even taking the steps to make sure they're paying their suppliers more promptly than they normally would do to make sure that those suppliers who are critical to their supply chains can stay afloat. So indeed, supply chain disruption is having a big impact on all of us. And how do I think I see this changing as we sort of move into a world and a world where we've had a, pandem a, a pandemic and a world where people are saying, yes, you might well see additional pandemics and therefore we need to be prepared. It's been really encouraging to see how much collaboration there has been between sometimes naturally competing organizations to solve some of the sector problems. And yes, a lot of that has been directly related to uh, coronavirus. So the work that's gone on between competitors to find ways of um, building ventilators. Companies that never normally built ventilators have worked together and worked with uh, designs from companies whose specialism is building ventilators to share those designs in a collaborative way towards solve those, solve those sector issues. And at the same time, we've seen many organizations appreciate the importance of having real transparency down their supply chains. So it might not just be your prime supplier that's causing that disruption to your supply chain. It might be your supplier supplier or your supplier 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 or indeed your supplier 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 supplier. So having that transparency down in the supply chains, I think, is going to be really important in the future. And that's where technology undoubtedly comes in. As uh, procurement and supply professionals are thinking about how do they move forward then, and how do they build these resilient supply chains, I do believe it's so important that people think about the organization and they think about the challenges that the organization is facing and how is the organization going to come up with um, the right resilience. And then, yes, we need to make sure that the supply chain fits that resilience. But I do believe this is a real opportunity for the profession to yet again make sure that we've been properly heard at the top table in terms of us talking business first and function second. And then perhaps importantly to today's discussion, which is gonna be all about people and capabilities, yeah, we do need to make sure that we have the right data and the right capabilities and the right data driven by you know, having the, um, the right systems that can provide us with accurate data and then indeed the right capabilities and that's down to all of us to make sure that we are um, investing in and developing people with the right talent for the future. So with that new context um, and the, the impact of coronavirus, I felt it was really important that we didn't also um, ignore some of the really important things that are going on which impact so hugely on our profession. And there's just three or four that I want to cover here today. The first one to me is all about digital transformation. And we've talked a lot about this in recent years. We have started to see though now some really good concrete examples of how organizations are really benefiting from that investment in technology 
and the transparency and also the control that that technology brings. And I just wanted to highlight here some of the work that we've seen Vodafone do, where they've put their focus on technology, not into blockchain or not into just advanced in the analytics, but really into making sure that the basics, the basics are done really, really well. And they have focused on putting in place a, a really, really strong system to manage POs, to make sure they have the right data, that they have the right control. Um, they've catalogued 22,000 components and focused on those components to make sure that they've, they're understanding the true cost linked to the design of those components. They've also, whilst cataloging these components, looked at CO2 emissions. So that increased visibility that comes from that better catalog and those better systems allows them to have that, that better data, that one version of the truth, which allows them to be more efficient and also to embrace some of the challenges around sustainability. And talking of sustainability, there's a really interesting uh, organization called, um, which is 19 food giants who have got together under the banner of One Planet Business for, diverse, for Diversity. Um, and I could have highlighted any of the organizations shown on this slide. I just want to touch briefly on some of the, I think, the really exciting stuff that, that L'Oreal have been doing. And let's be clear, you know, sustainability is absolutely an issue. You know, climate change this year, fires in Australia, droughts in Zimbabwe and Zambia, the massive floods in the UK earlier in the year, which we've now probably all forgotten about, um, should leave us under no illusions whatsoever about the challenges that sustainability presents and the importance of ensuring our su supply chains are sustainable. So what L'Oreal have done, a number of examples here, they've really focused on how do they have the right traceability for vanilla coming from supplies in Madagascar. Um, in, uh, in Mexico, they wanted to make sure that their supply chains were truly resilient for candela wax. And then Burkina Faso, which is a major source of shea butter, shea butter um, is a, a key component in manufacturing skin cosmetics. And L'Oreal have done is work with 30,000 shea nut gatherers in Burkina Faso to make sure they had the best practice in place in terms of collection and processing. But what they've also done is made sure they can help those suppliers, um, those, those individual gatherers, to, to have a better life by, by investing in cooking stoves. And cooking stoves, which have made it um, more practical for these people to be able to work, to live, and um, to be able to gather their shea nuts. They've also reduced CO2 consumption by 9,000 tons. And they've reduced wood consumption, which would have been burnt on fires by 4,500 tons as well. So some really good concrete examples here of how organizations are embracing sustainability. And within SIPS, we've been working very hard with the construction industry. Uh, many of you will know that we've been involved in the Grenfell Tire Inquiry, um, that horrendous event of June uh, 2017 in London. Um, and what that's led to is us working with the industry, with other professional bodies, to come up with a, a, a series of, of procurement competencies which need to be applied in construction and making sure that the procurement leads are properly accredited against those competencies and that those competencies will in the future be applied in all stages in the construction process. Raising standards in, in, in procurement, raising standards of construction continues to be a real focus for, for us at SIPS. So I guess in summary, as I look at this new context and this new world that we're operating in today, supply chain resilience has never been more important. And getting the right transparency, getting the right visibility, having the right systems to allow you to do that are unbelievably important. Collaboration, the collaboration we have seen in recent months, I think has been fantastic. And I really do hope that as we move into a post-pandemic environment, we will see that continued focus on what I would call non-competitive collaboration. And let's not then forget at the same time how important sustainability is to all of us, how important it is that we're protecting our planet, that we're using scarce resources in a professional and responsible way. And for those of us at SIPS, how can we support this agenda? Look, it's very much about ensuring that the people in the profession have the right skills, have the right competencies. For me, it's always been all about people. Um, and, and our role is to make sure that we can help support that, 
we can help support people development, we can help raise the voice of the profession and continue to raise those standards in procurement and supply. So for me, there's never been a more exciting time for the profession. There truly are today really great careers and really great opportunities. We're seeing lots of changes, we're seeing lots of um, talk about supply chains, and I go back to something I said perhaps a year or so ago. When it gets to the stage when people are thinking about who they work for, or thinking about whose products they buy, or thinking about which company they invest in, which is in part based on the approach that that organization is taking towards risk mitigation, and those issues which you're really mitigating the risk of are really important topics for society, then no doubt in my mind, the procurement and supply is absolutely a boardroom topic. And that for me allows the opportunity for really, really great people, really capable people to make a huge difference. And I'm convinced we're going to see much more of that in the years to come.